Okay, everyone. So today we are going to talk. This is the home run. Now this is, uh, we're almost done. The semester has been the weirdest semester that we've had, right? I'm just locking the meeting here so we don't have somebody coming in as I'm trying to record. The weirdest semester, I just hope that everybody's doing well. Uh, and like I said, in a few days, we're gonna have the final exam and this uh, week's uh, content is also going to be on the final exam. So if you have any questions, don't hesitate to contact me, okay? Okay, so here's what we're gonna talk today about. We're gonna talk about equine infectious anemia. And equine infectious anemia is a disease um, that we, you guys, I don't know if you're very familiar with uh, the term equine infectious anemia. I know you're familiar with the testing that goes for this disease and that test is the Coggins uh, uh, test. So that test was developed many, many years ago because it's something that once the horse has, the horse is gonna have it for the rest of its life. So uh, the Coggins test, anytime a horse is going to competition, is crossing state lines, is going to sale, is going to any place traveling, this horse needs to have the proof of negative Coggins. And that was one of the way, you know, the entire world operates like that. There are countries that are free of equine infection and anemia, but the majority of the countries are not, okay? Uh, so it is a disease that is uh, going to be described uh, with recurrent episodes of fever, lethargy, inappetence, Thrombocytopenia, thrombocytopenia. So if you guys know the word, uh, the word thrombosis, it's blood clots uh, inside the blood vessel. So thrombocytopenia is uh, the decrease in the number of platelets. Okay, so thrombocytopenia, the decrease in the number of platelets. And also, as the name suggests, anemia. Okay, so anemia is low number of red blood cells. Uh, it was first described in 1843. And uh, it is part of, let me share here because I'm going to try to write cer certain things. It is part of, can I make this bigger? Oh, I guess I can. Of a family of diseases or family of uh, viruses that is called Alenti virus okay a lentivirus as the word suggests i don't know if you know what lenti actually is but it means slow so lentiviruses what means is they generally cause once you get the disease you have it forever it's a slow chronic progressive kind of disease that leads to death. That's what most lentiviruses cause, okay? Other lentiviruses are HIV, human immunodeficiency virus, FIV, feline immunodeficiency virus, BIV, bovine immunodeficiency virus. So as you guys can see, uh, can see. Now, equine is not called equine immunodeficiency virus, okay? It is called equine infectious anemia, which is a lentivirus. So this is very similar types of diseases, but it's not, uh, the infection, equine infectious anemia is not an immunodeficiency virus that slowly causes progressive disease that leads to death. More commonly, the horse gets the disease, has an acute episode, gets better, is going to be a carrier for that disease forever, gets better and now doesn't even show signs of the disease anymore and becomes a silent carrier. So that's more general how it is with equine infection anemia. We're going to talk about there's going to be three types of horses, okay, that, that this disease is going to show the profile. Now, what, one of the things that is important, I want, uh, let me see here. Oh, I can do red. Okay. One of the things that I think is important is that uh, not only is this a lentivirus, which means it causes a slow, it's a disease that is with you forever. Uh, it is also from the family that's called retroviridae 
virus. So retroviruses, retroviruses, what happens is when uh, their genetic material is going to be replicated, okay? Generally, here's a genetic material. Uh, viruses, uh, cells, bacteria, they start replicating from one end and go to the other end, okay? It's generally like, if you guys remember, C, A, G, T, blah, blah, and then they start to do the other strand with G, G, T, C, A, okay? So this is how anything that has genetic material is going to replicate, it's going to do it this way, which we called five, two, three, okay? Uh, retroviruses, retroviruses, I'm going to delete this, hold on, delete. Retroviruses, don't do it like that, okay? Retroviruses, are going to do it the other way around, okay? So they use uh, this enzyme that's called reverse transcriptase. And that enzyme, instead of replicating this way, it is going to replicate backwards, okay? When it does this, because it uses this enzyme and replicates backwards, the machinery that does the proofreading, so all the genetic material is done correctly, it is going to lack that. So there is no proofreading in retroviruses. So they are going to continue to replicate backwards. And every time they replicate, and this is the catch now, every time they replicate, because they lack proofreading, there's going to be mutations that are going to happen. For example, let me just give you an example. A, T, C, G. This, instead of being a T, it should be, may become an A. This may become an A2, which is correct. And this may, instead of becoming a G, becomes a C. This becomes a G. So it just lacks that proofreading material. And then when the new strands of viruses come out, the strains of viruses come out, they are going to be mutated. And that is one of the problems with HIV, FIV, uh, BIV. And that's the difficulty of creating vaccines for these particular viruses, even though FIV, there is vaccine for that, BIV also, but uh, HIV, there isn't. But because uh, every time these viruses replicate and these people, these animals have these viruses for life, there is going to be mutations and sometimes enough mutations that elicit almost a new course of the disease. And then uh, the disease that the, the horse or, or the animal had last time created uh, antibodies and an immune response against it. And now because this is enoughly mutated, the immune response that the animal has doesn't totally get rid, doesn't recognize that new virus, and then you have to, again, create new immune response, which takes a longer, like two weeks at least, time, so the animal gets sick again, as opposed to certain diseases, we have immune response. After it comes out again, we are able to, or the horse is able to uh, utilize their uh, circulating antibodies and immunity against that uh, virus that comes, that we get in contact again. So in this particular case, they can't, okay? Because, I mean, they can, but they uh, sometimes, like I said, we're gonna talk about three different horses, but sometimes they are going to uh, be so mutated that the horse needs to mount up a whole new immune response. Let me try to do this, clear all drawings. Okay, sounds good. So I hope you guys were able to uh, see that. Um, what was I going to say? I've made annotations here of all the things that I wanted to say. So the transmission and the prevalence that we want to talk about this virus, uh, it is, like I said, it's a worldwide disease. Uh, certain countries don't have it, but as you know, but the majority of the countries have it. Um, it is the, it's a vector type of disease. So it is transmitted from one animal to the other via insects. Okay. What's important is that the insects that cause this disease, 
uh, they are called the most important ones, okay, are called tabanids. So this is not like we talked about Eastern, Western uh, equine cephalitis and West Nile virus. These are caused by mosquito bites. This particular disease, equine infectious anemia, is caused by uh, flies. So as many as 52 flies, okay, biting a horse. But the most important vector is called tabanids. And tabanids are going to, the reason why they're super important is because there are several things. Number one, they are just a mechanical vector. So they, uh, they have big mouth parts and they are what we know as the horse flies, those black flies that bite the horse and the horse gets crazy, wants to buck, or deer flies, which are a little bit smaller. Uh, but their bite causes a lot of pain. They have big mouth parts and when they suck the blood, their mouth parts are so big and they slash the skin of the horse to suck on the blood. And because they cause so much pain, the horse shakes, 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 uh, hits with the tail and that tabanid, the horse fly, ca carrying a lot of blood in its mouthpiece goes and bites another horse, okay? If there is another horse in the vicinity. So that's something that you guys need to understand. The other thing too, because it's an insect vector, you guys can, can already postulate that this is a warm climate type of disease, right? So this is important too. Uh, just to give an example, certain parts in Brazil, uh, like in the Pantanal area, which is this large swamp that we have in Brazil, which is wet for six months of the year, uh, like dr totally underwater, uh, up to about 50% of the herds in that area is going to have the disease. So here is Brazil. I don't know how to draw Brazil. Here you go. I don't know. But this area of Brazil right here. And the thing is, so uh, there is no treatment for the disease. And what you have to do, and we're going to see here in a second, uh, you have to keep this horse isolated from any other horse or you have to euthanize the horse. Okay. Or for countries that allow uh, the slaughter of horse, you can also send this horse to be slaughtered as long as the truck that the horse is going to be is totally shut so um you know so there is no tab and it's biting the horse and spreading wherever the horse goes which is probably very unlikely to happen uh, but how can you so you have so these farms here in brazil have like uh, a herd of cattle of let's say twenty thousand herds of cattle and they're gonna have let's say a thousand head of horses 50 percent of these horses are going to be uh, contaminated. So how are you going to euthanize 500 of this horse? Then you have to buy a new horse. They are also going to get contaminated soon. And like I said, here in a second, we're going to talk about this three horse. The great majority of this horse don't even show signs of the disease anymore. They're just like normal horse, but they are carriers. So what these farms do, they just leave the positive horses, say, for example, in the middle of the farm, and then have the negative horses around because those horses can have contact with other horses. So that's something that um, is interesting because, you know, to try to prevent the killing of all these horses, okay? Uh, the prevalence of this disease is very hard to define because unless you test every single horse, there is really no way to find the prevalence. We can assume what the prevalence is based on the testing that we already do. Uh, so it's said that the prevalence in the United States is 0.003%, 0 0.003%. 0 .003%, and that's based on the testing that we do every year because every horse to have a, a current Coggins, it, it's a year um, test, okay? And uh, this, this test is needed to um, enter competition, traveling, etc. Now, for the horses, the United States has uh, 7.2 million horses, 7.2 million horses, and uh, this test is done by USDA certified labs, Coggins, there's an ELISA test also, which is a little faster. And the, the USDA uh, tests more or less 1.2 to 2 million horses a year, million. Let me delete this guy here, eraser. Two million, do two million horses a year. 
Uh, and here's the other thing too that happens several. So this is one time it's an annual uh, test that you do, but a lot of the times you lost your current Coggins or you moved to a different state and you cannot find it. When you get there, uh, it was damaged. And then a lot of this time, a lot of times these horses are tested multiple times the same year. So instead of one horse testing today and then testing only 365 year, days after today, they may be tested after six months of today. So these tests are going to include this. The other thing too is that the horses that get tested annually are horses that supposedly have what? Higher value, right? Because it's horses that are going to be traveling, they have been sold, they're entering competition. So horses that just live in somebody's backyard that never leave the place don't actually have to be tested. So there's maybe horses that... Um, are positive and they may be infecting, but they are not gonna show signs of disease and they may be positive when we don't know. So it's clear, close to impossible to find the true prevalence of this disease in, for example, in any country, but also the United States. Now we know that some countries have it endemic, like very, very many horses in those countries have the disease. For example, uh, Italy is one of them. Romania is another one of them, and I don't know if they don't have good testing or what. Now, uh, because this is a disease that uh, is transmitted via insect bite, some countries that are cold feel that they don't need to do a lot of testing like we do here, uh, so we do every year. Uh, so like Canada doesn't uh, mandate that horses be, you know, to enter competition to be tested, uh, every year to have a current Coggins like we do here and they have been having uh, more equine infectious anemia a few years ago 13 horses that went to Spruce Meadows uh, had to be euthanized because all of 13 high quality Grand Prix jumpers uh, were positive or sick with equine well one was sick and then they went to test everybody in the premise and 13 horses were positive for the disease and they had um, to be euthanize. Uh, one of the things that I was saying about the tabanids, okay, when they bite, so tabanids generally they have uh, this thing that they bite a horse and then the horse tries to shoot them away and if there's a horse close to the other horse they will go, they may go to the other horse but generally they come back to the same horse and that's how the USDA has rules about uh, if you want to keep your horse um, alive you have to create a place for this horse to be that's a, a, it's 200 yards away from any other horse which is hard to do in like say in lexington okay but it is uh, possible to do in other states uh in one year, several years ago in ireland there was a first uh description of this disease being spread via aerosol particles. So generally it's blood, direct blood contact. So the tabanids or uh, using syringes or needles that have been used in another positive horse, dental equipment, uh, dirty castration uh, that haven't been totally cleaned before from one operation to the next one. That's generally how the spread happens from one horse. So in nature, tabanids and flies iatrogenically, which means the veterinarian or the person actually gave without knowing to another horse, is from uh, blood transfusions, needles, reusing needles. So it's common practice to reuse needles in cattle, but it should not be done in horses, okay? So in cattle, you put them through the chute to vaccinate and go boom, 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 like at up to 10, 20. I mean, some people go hundreds, okay, without changing the needle, but ideally for horses, you need to use new needles um, every time. Uh, so like I was saying in Ireland a few years ago, this veterinarian smuggled blood from Italy into Ireland and gave serum to four foals, okay, because you know how uh, foals when they're born, if they have low IgG, you give uh, hyperimmune plasma or serum to these foals. And so this veteran, but this serum was positive, had equine infectious anemia in it, was positive for the virus. And uh, these foals then started with foals and what happened was 
they contaminated and I think it was 38 horses that, yeah, 38 horses that became positive after that. And the way that they actually found out is that there was this horse in, in Dublin, uh, hospital, veterinary hospital that died and bled everywhere. And they went and uh, sprayed, uh, power washed because it bled and it was positive for the disease that they didn't know at the time. Okay. And they, the horse, uh, they went with the power wash and washed the whole thing and aerosolized all these particles and everybody that was in the hospital that time got the disease possibly by, uh, that was postulated by breathing in this aerosolized viral particles that was created from pressure washing the area that the horse was dead. Horses now get positive and they got traced back to these four poles that this one veterinarian, um, gave plasma to plasma that was smuggled into Ireland from Italy. Italy is endemic for this disease. Uh, like I said, mosquitoes don't pass this disease to horses. It needs to be flies. So horse flies, deer flies, stable flies. Um, the, and what I was talking about, how these flies um, behave, if the horse is one foot away, 87% of the time, this horse, this fly goes back to the same horse. If a horse is six feet away or 160 feet away, 99% uh, of these flies go back to the same horse. So that's why the USDA has the rule that horses that are positive, if you don't want to euthanize this horse, uh, they need to be kept 200 yards away from any other horse. Vertical transmission. So vertical transmission is from pregnant mare to the fetus. Vertical transmission is possible but it's rare okay so but what one of the things that happened though is that um the foals when the foals um are born from mares that are that carry the virus that are infected with the virus when they are born they are going to uh drink the colostrum and the colostrum is going to have antibodies for the virus and the Coggins test actually is testing for antibodies okay for this virus and the foes, if they are tested within six months to eight months, they will test positive, even though they may not have the disease. Now, may, they may have the disease too, but many times these foes tested a year later, they are negative because that antibody that was tested was antibodies that he or she drank from uh, the mother. Let me clear this, clear all drawings. Uh, here's the thing. There are Three types of horses and the clinical signs, like I said, are fever, anemia, thrombocytopenia. So the horse is just not unthrifty. Okay, the horse is not doing super well. He's skinny. Uh, this is called swamp fever also because of you know, swamp, like where there's all these flies nasty and this horse just can be unthrifty. Uh, the one, there's three horses, three. Horses. The one has the acute episode that leads to death. Okay, it's so severe. The thrombocytopenia, the anemia is so severe that the horse dies. Okay, that horse is not really a problem because he is dead. He's not going to transmit the disease. I mean, it has to be buried, incinerated, etc. If he was tested and found positive for the disease, sometimes. It's so common, like around here, to not have this disease that a lot of the times they, the, the horses are caught accidentally when they're doing their annual Coggins um, that they see that the horse is positive. Very few cases of the horses, oh, sick and fever, thrombocytopenia, anemia, and the veterinarian says, oh, let's try for, let's try for equine infectious anemia and see if he is. Very seldom does this happen here, okay? In other countries or, um, maybe in Texas, New Mexico, maybe uh, Louisiana. Louisiana is actually the state that has the most, the more, uh, the most prevalence because of the swamp that we have there. Uh, the second one, of course, that we have, he's gonna have the acute disease. And after that acute disease, has fever for two, three days. You give Benamine, he has a little anemia. The veterinary doesn't think anything of it. The horse gets better, he then gets better. And he 
is going to um, never have the disease again, okay? Uh, he may have some recurrent diseases every few months, like once or twice, and they hey, may get, get better and become, he's a chronic carrier. He's a carrier, but he may be a healthy animal. He may not have the disease anymore. Uh, and he's going to be called what we call chronic inapparent, okay? In a parent carrier. So you don't even know that he's sick, okay? Especially horses that stay outside all the time. They are retired. They, you, the owners a lot of the time don't even know that the horse is sick, that the horse went off feed, went off hay, okay? So this is... the most common, okay, that happens. Uh, and then the third horse that happens, um, it is, he has the acute disease, and then he continues to have recurring episodes every couple of months. He has the recurring, 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 just gets worse and worse and worse and worse. And then that uh, it's like a wasting kind of disease. And that's the one that's called the swamper because uh, he just wastes away, it's unthrifty. And this is a horse that never looks good. And then uh, when tested for equine infectious anemia, it's found that that's what this horse has. So there's three. One is acute and dies. The other is acute may have the disease once or twice again, but just gets better and never has a disease again. He's an, in an, he is an inapparent carrier. And then we have the third type that is the one that has, is chronically infected and has a disease over and over again uh, to the point that he wastes away, okay? It's an unthrifty horse and uh, that's the chronic type of horse, okay? There are, Two types of uh, how do we diagnose the disease? So we have the agar, the A -G agar gel immunodiffusion, uh, and that is what we know by Coggins. Okay, and then we have so Coggins is a 24 hour uh, test, and then we have ELISA for this. ELISA is a quick test to find antibodies. And this is a two hour test. Uh, and however, the ELISA, because it's so, so sensitive, there may be lots of false positives. If the horse is positive on the ELISA, he needs to do the Coggins, okay? Before the uh, result is um, passed on. So that's some of the things. So if the horse is negative on the ELISA, he's negative, well, most likely. If he's positive, it doesn't necessarily mean that he's positive. He has to be confirmed with the Coggins. Um, the pathologic findings for this horse. So uh, upon necropsy, you're going to find hepatomegaly. So his liver is going to be enlarged. You're going to find splenomegaly. So his spleen is going to be enlarged. There's going to be petechiation all over uh, his organs. And the reason for that is because of thrombocytopenia. So the platelets is so low in the, in the total blood count that the horse is just gonna have um, micro bleedings everywhere, okay? Because it's not clotting the blood. He's also, you're also gonna see edema uh, everywhere in the horse. So this is a pond necropsy. This is what is found uh, on these horses. There is no therapy, guys. There is absolutely nothing to be done. I mean, when the horse is having the fever, he's going to be treated with benamine, soft foods, etc. But uh, there is nothing to heal this disease. It's a chronic disease. Once the horse has it, he has it for life. Okay. How to prevent? Try to prevent flies, horse flies. There are. If you go on, I think YouTube. There is a way, some people for some reason has a ton of horse flies in their property. And I don't know if because their property is more wet or why, but there are contraptions that people make with like mirrors and soapy water to try to collect all these horse flies. So how to prevent, don't have horse flies around. Sometime when we go uh, trail riding, there is horse flies there. So you can put a sheet on the horse or use very heavy fly sprays uh, to try to prevent uh, and repel these horse flies. 
uh, and again, to prevent once the horse is positive, he, the best thing to actually do is to euthanize the horse, okay? Uh, and this is in equine infectious anemia. It's a disease that we don't see all the time. Now the AEP has uh, that EDCC website that you can sign up and you are going to receive uh, updates for multiple diseases. And they say, you know, there was an equine infectious anemia uh, horse found in blah, blah state or sometimes in Canada, it reports for, from Canada too. Sounds good. So equine infectious anemia, simple, simple guys, okay? So if you, let me stop sharing here so I can. So if you have any questions, don't hesitate to contact me.